Hi there everyone, it's Dennis again. Sorry it took me so long to post the second video, but today I'd like to share with you this little 5881 single ended amplifier I built. And I'm also going to make some changes to the original circuit. I've been using it with the 6DJ8 input stage, and it sounds really good, but since I've been using it a lot with my iPhone lately, I'm probably going to change the resistor so I can use it with a 12AX7 or maybe a 12AT7 and have a little more gain to compensate for the voltage difference between the iPhone output and a regular line stage output. Okay, so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, stay tuned. Here's the front of the amplifier. It's pretty simple and straightforward. You have a main switch, you have a B plus switch, the pilot light, the volume control and the input connector. I try to keep those things very simple because I don't like to have a lot of buttons, bells and whistles. I think the, this is a single-ended amplifier which is very simple and straightforward so the design needs to match the circuitry even though it sounds a little snob but that's the way I like to keep the design of those things. This is the back of the amplifier. You have a power cord, a three-prong power cord, you have a fuse, the power transformer that was taken from a Tektronix oscilloscope. As you guys probably know by now, I'm a sucker for Tektronix uh, oscilloscopes, especially the vintage ones. And since they were always using premium components and very good stuff, I like to salvage as much as I can from them whenever I come across one. Those two connectors are your reading points for the plate current. Those go straight to the cathodes on the output tubes so you can have a direct reading. There's a 10 ohm resistance between the cathodes and ground. So you read the voltage, you do your little ohms law and you find your plate current. Uh, even though this is a single ended amplifier, it still uses a fixed bias circuit. So these two trim pots here will adjust the plate current. Those two outer pots are going to adjust the feedback, the negative feedback, so we can keep distortion within limits and have a nice extended frequency response. You have those cool vintage Amphenol output binding posts here. They were also taken from a Tektronix oscilloscope. I don't know in the video if you guys can see it, but the positives are these outer posts here and they're gray, whereas these in the middle are the negatives and they're black. I don't know how well the video shows it, but yeah, it's actually gray and you can see the difference. I'm now, gonna... when I remove the cover, you can see the interesting part. Uh, here you see the two 5881s. Uh, I did something a little different. Um, try, and, try and pull one out here without causing too much damage. But as you guys can see, I recessed the sockets. So I have a very low pro. Here's the back of that amplifier plate. And as I said, it looks a little messy because of the point to point wiring. But as, as you can see here, as long as you have your filament lines away from the input high impedance lines, you should be fine. There's no harm problem. Uh, the coupling caps, as you can see here, they're vintage Tektronix caps. Those were made by Sprague. They're very high quality. They're military grade and they were used in plugins and amplifier plugins in those oscilloscopes and they were basically the first thing the signal encountered as it entered the the oscilloscope so they had to be very high quality and respect the signal to its best even though i don't like to use old caps because you can have dc leakage problems i actually made an exception for those guys because i originally had orange drops in there and orange drops, as you all know, sound really good, but those guys, <laughs> they went the extra mile and it sounds amazing. It sounds really, really good, much better than any other type of capacitor I ever used. So I decided to keep them there. Uh, I tested. I have eight of those and all eight of those are within spec. They're usually 1.1 microfarad something, so they're all within spec. And especially I tested them with a high voltage power supply. I built this little power supply where I can have from zero to 800 volts. And those were capable of withstanding 600 volts, which is their nominal voltage. So for me, they're as good as new. I know it's something some people advocate against. I myself advocate against, but they sound so freaking good that I'm gonna keep them there and I don't care. There's no leakage, as I said, everything's working perfect so yeah those capacitors really really good yep. stuff this is a mini watt made in holland by philips 
and those tubes are very high quality and uh, here's my stash of 12AX7s those are mostly uh, mini watch made in Holland or in Brazil and I have a, a few mullards made in the UK as well and I mean the original the real mullards made in Great Britain not the Russian tube they're selling as if they could and apparently they can get away with that but that's anyway that's that's a different topic those might be great tubes but those are not mullards those are mullards uh, the output transformers were also salvaged from a Philips equipment they were salvaged from an old uh, reel to reel recorder they're 8k and they have a weird 21% uh, ultra linear tap now that's pretty cool because usually the ultra linear taps are at 43 percent and since i'm running it closer to uh, the plate voltage the tube's gonna work in uh, triode operation mode almost the triode operation mode that's gonna lower my power of course but that's going to increase the linearity and this amplifier sounds just like a single-ended triode amplifier so that's pretty cool uh, those transformers sound really well, but I think I'm going to replace them. I'm probably going to custom wind a larger transformer because I think here inductance is the name of the game. The more inductance you have, the better bass response you achieve. It's not that I'm, not, I'm, I'm unhappy with the bass response of this amplifier, but I think I can do a little better. Overall, this is very flat. Here's the power supply section. Very simple choke input type power supply. And I do that because I need 250 clean volts, very clean volts for the B+, plus because it's a single-ended amplifier. And single-ended amplifiers are notorious for having hum problems. So to avoid that, I have this very inefficient but very good filter arrangement called choke input filter, where you don't use a regular pi input filter like you have with two capacitors, but just one capacitor. So the high voltage goes straight from the diodes into the choke then from the choke into the capacitors this is as I said a very inefficient arrangement because you're gonna waste a lot of energy in this type of filtering but that's gonna make for a very clean uh, power supply and you're gonna have a very good signal to noise there's this little trick I use in the power supply that I'd like to show you here is that uh, electrolytic capacitors they're very good for filtering low frequencies but they're a little inefficient because they become inductive as the frequency goes up. And when you start to have this weird sound effect on mid and high frequency, sometimes it's due to uh, the electrolytic capacitors of the power supply. So to avoid that, what I do is that I usually parallel one of those uh, film type capacitors with the electrolytic capacitor. So each capacitor type will handle a different frequency. Uh, here I have four 220 microfarad uh, capacitors in parallel, which is an 880 microfarad equivalent, in parallel with a 10 microfarad at 400 volts DC. So this is my capacitor equivalent in the power supply. Then you have this little 2K resistor here and another 10 microfarad capacitor. This uh, leg of the power supply, if you will, is just for the 12AX7. So since uh, the current here is very low, I can get away with just 10 microfarads and I'm not paralleling with any other capacitor. This electrolytic here belongs to the bias power supply. So yeah, uh, those capacitors are called SCR, uh, just like in the rectifiers. They're made in France, they're MKP uh, type. They're a little expensive, they're a little pricey. Usually they cost around 18 bucks a piece, but... Um, they sound great and I like to use them in power supplies whenever I can. Then again, as I said, combining them with electrolytics should get you there in terms of sound spending less than half the price. If I were to use a 68 microfarad capacitors, which is not that big in terms of capacitance, I would probably have to spend 70 to 80 euros per capacitor. Whereas here I'm spending, I don't know, 40 bucks here and 10 bucks here. So, yeah, you can do more with less money. I use this uh, perforated aluminum plate here to have some convection cooling taking place. So the air comes from the bottom of the amplifier where there are holes, passes through the tubes, cooling them, and leaves from the front in this S-shape uh, pattern. This way I can avoid drilling holes to the top plate. 
because I find that if you have holes in the top plate it's an entrance point for debris and dust and um, I've been using this amplifier for three weeks now and as you can see it's pretty much clean inside and since I have a cat I'm the proud father of the cutest black cat in the whole damn world <laughs> he likes to sit on top of the amplifier because it's a little warm and uh, as he moves around there's a lot of cat hair going in so that's why I did it and it stays pretty cool I don't have a problem I even thought about putting a fan here but it, as it turns out it was not necessary set up uh, I'm feeding the amplifier from the signal generator app on the iPhone and it's actually pretty cool because it's a free app and uh, low distortion uh, it covers the whole audio band so if you only work with audio projects that's a pretty cool cheap if not free signal generator the amplifier is at full blast here's um it's been warming up here's the bias uh the cathode current on one tube the cathode current on the other tube and uh i'm going to adjust that i'm going to let it warm up even more and adjust that later on the output goes through a pair of non-inductive um r call 8 ohm resistors and I'm reading the output here in the oscilloscope. So yeah, as you can see, uh, we're at one kilohertz now, isn't it? Yeah, we're probably about one kilohertz. We're at, yeah. Oh, there we go, up. Oh. I don't know if you can hear it, but the output transformer is singing. <laughs> you can kind of hear it from the output transformer. So we're at the one volt per division scale, so this is one channel, this is the other channel. And we're at about one, two, three, four, five, and we're about 10. So well, we're almost 10 watts. Yeah, we're almost 10 watts uh, from this uh, single NN amplifier. So that's pretty cool. Now let's play with the frequency a little bit and see if it's stable throughout the audio spectrum. So we're now at 250 Hertz. It stays uh, stable. Now let's go back a little further. We're now at 63 hertz. Uh, we're 50 hertz. Still going strong. 50 hertz. Let's go back a little further. 40 hertz. It's still there. It starts to it starts to lose a little, but it's still there. Now let's go back to. 20 hertz heck let's let's see it at 20 hertz and uh, even though you can see we lost uh an entire division half a division per uh, so we lost almost uh, two volts on the output but the shape of the waveform is pretty cool for 20 hertz a single end amplifier i think that's pretty cool now let's go a little higher and see how it goes uh we're at 1200 Hertz I say I want a little more 5k there we are 5k uh, let's go to 10k yeah looks pretty clean pretty good uh, as you can see full power no distortion at 10 kilohertz now let's go a little further 15k still now you start to lose some power uh we lost then again almost a division but we're at 16 kilohertz now let's go the full 20 kilohertz and yeah at 20 kilohertz you see you lose an entire division on each side you lose uh, you lose about four volts so yeah I'd say it's good from 25 30 Hertz all the way up to 15 kilohertz but for a single ended triad amplifier I say try it because it's almost triad connected and that output transformer with the ultra linear tap I think it's pretty cool there's this other adjustment I like to do uh, first I set the bias for the right cathode current as per the data sheet of the tube or the circuit I'm using and then I'm gonna set the feedback and firstly I set the feedback with a one kilohertz signal one channel at a time until I get the cleanest 
response possible at the best power level. Then I go and check it again at 100 hertz. Then I'll check it again at 20 hertz. Then I'll check it again at 5K, at 10K, 15, 20K, all the way. And I do it until I have a flat, nice frequency response. I do that for each channel. And once the amplifier is set, what I do is that I come here to the oscilloscope and I invert one channel and I add both channels. So right now I'm seeing the difference of both channels. As you can see, there's still some difference and I'm gonna get rid of that and that makes a difference. So I'm going to increase the sensitivity here. I'm now at 0.2 volts per division, actually 0.1 volts per division, as you can see. And all you need to do is touch up. I'm gonna try and get my screwdriver in the right trim pot here. All you need to do is touch up. There you go, as you can see. Once you have as little difference as possible. There you go, now there's a little blip there. There's something going on there. And I think that's actually the cell phone. The cell phone that was on top of the amplifier. There you go, so we're gonna set that here. And uh, as long as you don't go overboard with the cathode current, you can even touch up the bias and uh, it makes a difference. There you go. Here's the schematic of the amplifier. As you can see, pretty simple. Uh, you have your input connector going through a pot. It's a 10K uh, logarithm pot. It's an Alps stereo pot. Sounds really good. It uh, goes straight into the grid of the 12AX7. We have a 100K resistor on the plate circuit and a 1000 ohm resistor in the cathode circuit. Pretty standard values. That 0.1 microfarad capacitor I showed you guys. A little grid stop resistor going into the 5881s. This is your negative voltage for the, for the bias adjustment. There you go, you have a minus 85 volt power supply. Goes into a pot into a simple voltage divider configuration. A little isolation resistor and that's it. Uh, here you have the ultralinear tap I told you about, the 21% ultralinear tap, the 10 ohm cathode resistor, and the cathode current readout. And that's all it has. Uh, there's the feedback loop, the feedback adjustment pot, uh, here's the 2000 ohm uh, drop resistor that I showed in the power supply, that 10 microfarad film capacitor as well, and a little 220k ohm resistor across it to bleed it. And that's all she wrote. So that was my single-ended 5881 amplifier. I hope you guys have enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed building the amplifier. And now I'm listening to it, and uh, I love it. Uh, I'm not going to stop there. I'm probably going to go through more projects, as it's always very exciting to build new stuff. Um, I'm willing to hear comments, suggestions, whatever. Please feel free to use the comment section, as long as it's uh, not offensive to anyone. Uh, just a little word of caution before I leave. Uh, I hope you guys are aware of the dangers involved in vacuum tube amplifiers. There's high voltage, uh, there's glass, there's heat, there's all sorts of hazards. So you can easily get injured, sometimes even killed if you mess up in a vacuum tube amplifier. So unless you're trained and willing to take the risk, and a little crazy <laughs> like I am, please don't even step near an open vacuum tube amplifier. But for those of you who are into it, it's a lot of fun. Well, I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed it. Please don't forget to like it, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys next time. Later.